love is sweet, his love is wild, it's waking hearts to life. And the Father loves, oh, the Father loves and sends his Son. Oh, the Son lays down his life for Yes, he lavishes his love upon us. He calls us now. His sons and daughters, he's reaching out. His love is deep, his love is wide, and it covers us. His love is fierce, his love is strong, he's furious. His love is sweet, his love is wild, it's waking hearts to life. His love is deep, his love is deep, his love is wide, and it covers us. His love is fierce, his love is strong, he's furious. His love is sweet, his love is wild, it's waking hearts to life. It's waking hearts to life. Yes, we're waking hearts to life. With your love. With your love. No, 
I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Sing that again. When darkness tries, when darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own. Brokenness and pain is all I know. No, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, shame no longer has a place to hide, and I am not a captive to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind No, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. This power that breaks off every chain, this power that can break off every chain, and this power that can empty out a grave, this resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name There's power in your name There's power Cause there's power that can break off every chain Yes, there's power that can empty out a grave This is resurrection power that can save There's power in your name Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear.
doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. It doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. It doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your
was shed for me This is how I find my battles See, there's a table There's a table that you prepared for me It's your body and your blood you shed for me This is how I find my battles And I believe And I believe you've overcome And I will lift my song of praise for what you've done This is how I find my battles this is how I find my battles This is how I find my battles This is how This is how I find my battles This is how I find my battles This is how I find my battles This is how In the valley I know that you're with me and Surely your goodness and your mercy follow me Now my weapons are praise and thanksgiving This is how I find my battles And I believe and I believe you've overcome my song of praise for what you've done and this is how I find my battles this is how I find my battles this is how I find my battles this is how yeah, this is how I find my battles this is how I find my battles this is how I find my battles this is how Oh, this is how I find my battles You may look like I'm surrounded But I'm surrounded by you You may look like I'm surrounded But I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded. It may look. by you, yes, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you, this is how I find my battles, 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 this is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles, yeah, it may look, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you, oh, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you, yeah. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. See me look like I'm surrounded. Oh, but I know.
starting to see the darkness around me is just the shadow of your wings. Oh, it's the shadow of your wings. My victories in Jesus' name. Victories in Jesus' name. It's my victories in Jesus' name. Yes. My victories in Jesus' name. It's my victories in Jesus' name. Yes. My victories in Jesus' name. Name. Oh, my victories in Jesus' name. This is how I fight. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. With praise, oh, with praise. This is how I find my battles. 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 This is how I find my battles.
in us tonight that you would make us whole every crack filled you're so good Lord thank you Jesus message and the mayor there is a born again believer she's spirit filled she's part of Woody and Mel's uh, church and she's the only Christian in the government there in Colombo and uh, they she's been very popular she's been she's done a lot of good things but there has been a, a satanic attack come against her um, where there are um, because she's been so popularized in in with the people that there's been this underground group of slanderers um, that are trying to form weapons against her and rip down her, her reputation um, and it's not even about her um, governing it's more about her uh, personally and so she uh, it's pretty serious so they had sent me a text and so I just want us to agree right now that every single tongue that has um, risen up against her in judgment is going to be brought down and that no weapon formed against her is going to prosper and so father as a family here that is deeply connected with the family uh, there in Sri Lanka father we just say no right now to that weapon that the enemy's trying to form and I ask father right now that you would pour out your love and mercy upon the enemies of God's people there Lord and that they would be shaken to their core with this impenetrable desire to see Jesus that you'd begin to just even mess them up in their dreams God that you'd begin to just disintegrate every single evil thought and purpose in their heart and in their mind and that you would reveal Jesus to them and that even through this that their souls would be captured for your kingdom and that her reputation as a believer and as a daughter of the Most High God will stay intact, Father. Father, we say that her governing will go even further now that what the enemy has used to try to destroy her and hold her back, she'll be propelled, Father, in greater ways, that her voice will be heard. We pray right now that you'd amplify her voice, that she would have the, the, the ear of even greater people, Father God, in the government there. 
but she has favor with Muslims. She has favor with the Buddhists, their Lord. That she is a voice crying in the wilderness. That she is a, a, a rose that's planted in a barren place. Father, we ask for peace to come over her mind, her her heart, Father, and every and every part of her, Father. We just speak, we just speak peace over her. We ask that you would just bless her, Lord, and wrap her in your goodness, Jesus. We love you, Father. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we come against the snake that is in her camp, Father God. We ask, Father God, for that person to be exposed, the Judas, Father God. Whatever is to happen, Father, we just ask for your mercy and your your goodness to overcome them and, and, and envelop them, Father God. The, uh, who is giving away secrets, who is exposing, and most of it is lies, Father God. They will be exposed themselves in the mercy and the goodness of God that flows through that mare, Father God, will touch their heart and they will repent and come to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, hug the neck and tell, squeeze somebody tight and tell them you love them and glad they are here. You ready? <clears throat> Good job, guys. We have to Good evening. How is everybody? Good? Awake? That was a nice saturation that my heart needed. Um, two things. Please keep Jennifer in your prayers. She and, yeah, Jeannie's with her. They are moving. They uh, moving her to be with her husband in their new home. Um, she'll be back to visit us so that way we can see her and we can love on her. Um, they still have some stuff to pick up. But they got out really early this morning, so I didn't even get to see her. So just be lifting them up in prayer. Pray for just pray for just some peace and just some ease as they make this transition. Um, but I didn't. Uh, I did not do a a uh, a very good job at saying thank you. for blessing us last week because what you all gave for us to go away with our family covered our entire trip and I cannot just be passive about what was given to not just James and I but our entire family because they, they really do, I want to say sacrifice, but I don't want to say sacrifice because our children do what they do because they want to. But to be able to bless them in a way because we were so over blessed and to be able to treat them and to spoil them a little bit was really nice this weekend. So I want to tell you thank you for giving to us that we could give to our family. And I appreciate it so much. Thank you. You know you love me. Oh. Amen. Wow. Smile. It's going to be good, I promise. <laughs> Y'all look at me like, I don't freaking believe you. <sighs> yeah, I was glad you got away too. My turn. All right. Okay. I don't need all this. Well, I got all this up here. 
can take this down. This was from Sunday. I'll just throw it over here. No, I can't throw them away. Especially now that I'm not typing as much. I don't know what's going on with me. And tonight, this is what I got. So, we all know this Holy Ghost. I'm just saying, this is not normal for Annette. So, <sighs> so let's go to Jeremiah 33. I want to share, um, and hopefully this will come out right. Um... I talked last week about restoration, and I want to continue on with that. And I want to, um, I, I really feel like there's a, a, something that is in the literal soil of Gatesville. Like, it's the literal, there's something literally in the land here. And so I'm going to give some scriptures tonight about um, the land and restoring. And I, I want to preface it by saying this. Um, we are not Israel. Amen. Everybody understands? Okay. We're not Jewish, and we are not Israel. Um, I'm not trying to take any scriptures out of context, but we are spiritual Israel, okay? And I, what, what I want to first show us is that there is a precedent in the Word of God when it comes to lands and not just people. Um, so I want to talk about what I feel like God's trying to do or wanting to do um, in the restoring the spiritual inheritance that's here, um, and it's probably Coral County, not just Gatesville, um, is what I'm kind of sensing. And some of this is actually, and I was, the Lord just reminded me of this. This scripture in Jeremiah 33 that I'm going to share, oh my God, there's so many little thingies on the floor, I'm freaking out. Um, this, the scripture in Jeremiah 33 was actually a scripture that the Lord had given us in temple. Um, and we had a stirring that we did every quarter. And part of the stirring was that we were just praying for our city and um, for our state and our nation. And, um, and we had the stirring for a while before he gave me the scripture. And then we started to pray these scriptures. And um, tonight, as I was standing there, I thought about a prayer in the very beginning when we started doing the stirrings about the commerce that was coming into the city of Temple. And I mean, I specifically, I have to go back and pull my journal out because I, mean, I know I wrote the whole thing down. Um, and the Lord was talking about new medical things that were going to come into the city, but there were going to be a lot of retail. There was, like a, there was a, a, a release of commerce that was coming into Temple. And I stood there tonight and thought, holy guacamole, it really happened. Like, it really, there, I mean, because... Have you been on 31st Street lately? There's like stuff. I'm like, Zaxby's, when when that go up? I'm like, how'd that happen? Um, and you, I'm reading constantly in the paper of new new businesses that are coming to Temple. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Like, who would purposely go to Temple? I mean, besides us who've been, you know what I mean? We all just kind of morphed into it. You know what I mean? None of us purposely said, I'm going to move to Temple, Texas. Um, it's kind of the same way with Gatesville. I'm just saying. You don't normally just end up in Gatesville. You probably were here. Or somebody was here before you, right? Or the state brought you and transferred you from one prison to another. As an employee, not a, not a prisoner. But if you were, we love you anyway. So, just saying. That could be too. <laughs> so, let's see if I can get all this out. So, Jeremiah 33, we're going to start in... <laughs> did I tell you six? Okay. Um, yeah. So it's, behold, in the future, restore Jerusalem. He's talking about the land of Jerusalem. I will lay upon it health and healing. I will cure them and will reveal to them the abundance of peace, prosperity, security, stability, and truth. And I will cause the captivity of Judah, which is praise. I will cause the captivity of praise and the captivity of Israel, the sons of God, to be reversed and will rebuild them as they were at first. I will cleanse them from all the guilt and iniquity by which they have sinned against me, and I will forgive all their guilt and iniquity by which they have sinned and rebelled against me. And Jerusalem shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and a glory before the nations of the earth, and hear all the good that I do for it. And they shall fear and tremble because of all the good and the peace, prosperity, security, stability I provide for it. 
Thus says the Lord. Yet again, there shall be hurt in this place of which you say it is a desolate waste without man and without beast, even in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate without man, without inhabitant, and without beast. There shall be heard again the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voices of those who sing as they bring sacrifices of thanksgiving into the house of the Lord, give praise and thanks to the Lord, the, the Lord of hosts, for the Lord. Lord is good, and his mercy and his kindness and steadfast love endure forever. For I will cause the captivity of the land to be reversed and to return it to be as it was at first, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in this place which is desolate without man, without beast, in, in all of its cities, there shall again be dwellings and pastures and shepherds resting their flocks. Oh, that's so good. Okay. So there is a captivity that happens to a location, a land, a city. It could be a land inside of us, yes, of course. But it also happens to, to physical areas that, has anybody like ever driven from one city to another and they feel something different as they go into it? Like all of a sudden you feel a kind of a different spirit as you're, as you're moving in? It's because sometimes, especially like if you go into Harker Heights, if you drive into Harker Heights, even if you're not very spiritual, you're probably discerning something as soon as, because even just the atmosphere in Harker Heights, you feel it, especially if you go down Business 190, you see all of the old buildings. You see, I mean, and you see it's all, and nothing's changed. It's been strip clubs and tattoo parlors since I was in school there. So, I mean, but you can feel it as you come into the city. When I'm a clean, I feel something different than when I'm, when I'm in Harker Heights. And so there's areas, there's, there's spirit. Now, look, we know that the Holy Spirit, he says that he's restoring not just the land, but he's restoring the sons of God. So you and I, as sons of God, we carry the stronghold, the Holy Spirit, okay? So any spirit that's over any city doesn't actually have governing over it if you're here. And if something else is governing our cities that we live in, besides the Spirit of God, it's because we're allowing it. Now, in Temple... Infirmity is a big deal because our economy in Temple is based on infirmity. The sicker you can get, the better it is for Temple. It runs our hotels, it runs our restaurants. Scott and White's the largest employee, employer that we have there. Exactly, it is. And so sickness is something that we fight against all the time. Now, you have some things here in your city that you fight against all the time. We all know what those things are. And so when the land is held captive, if someone is not governing it correctly, and I say someone as a group of people and not just this church, please, beloved, do not get the wrong idea about what I'm saying. I'm not saying the points got it down and we're the one who's going to govern and rule the city. We are, peace of the, we are peace of the bride. And the whole bride needs to govern according to what God has said. But we need to understand that part of the captivity of the, art of the city here is going to be released because we take our rightful places as sons and daughters of God. And then the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the healing voice, the free voice, we begin to sing it out. And as we sing out and as we begin to bring the, the, the power of God and the release and freedom of God, then we begin to change a city and we do it one person at a time. Amen. We do it one business at a time. That's why we need people in the kingdom of God to have their own businesses. We need people who love Jesus, who carry an inheritance of God to sow. That's why we do the daycare. <sighs> I did, in temple, I was like, please God, no, don't, 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 don't open a daycare. Please God, no. I'm like, you're not hearing God. I swear you're not hearing God. Because we had a daycare at the other church. I didn't want to do it. But do you know that it's the most, that very thing right there was the most important thing we could ever could have done because what we did is we sowed into the lives of the people. And by sowing into the lives of the people, we sowed into the lives of their children. And by sowing into the lives of their children, we began to change a generation. And we began to have a reputation and people began to acknowledge us. And, we, and so, when you sow into your city, it matters. Because you're sowing seed, there's something in here, you're sowing seed into what you believe is going to reap a harvest for you. So that's why we have a daycare here in Gatesville. 
because we believed that no matter we don't need to have advertising strategies what we need is to invest in young people we need to invest in their parents we need to just be here as a voice it takes a long time to overturn soil but you do it one day at a time right okay so let's go to Ezekiel 36 real fast bar, bar, bar. Okay, he's talking here about prophesying to the mountains and all that kind of good stuff. We're going to pick it up in verse 6. He says, Prophesy therefore concerning the land of Israel, and say to the mountains and the hills, to the ravines and the valleys, thus, is the, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and in my wrath, because I have suffered the shame and reproach of the nations. Thus, therefore, thus says the Lord, I have lifted up my hand and sworn, Surely the nations that are round about you shall themselves suffer shame and reproach. But you... O mountains of Israel, shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are soon to come home. Oh, come on now. This is, this, these, the scripture here in uh, Ezekiel 36 really is meaning a whole lot to me right now. Um, so, let's see if I can get it out. Verse 9, for behold, I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you shall be tilled and sown, and I will multiply men upon you, and the whole house of Israel, even all of it, the city shall be inhabited, and the waste places shall be rebuilt, and I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and be fruitful, and I will cause you to be inhabited according to your former estate, and I will do better for you than you're in your beginnings. And you shall know and understand and realize that I am the Lord, the sovereign ruler who calls forth loyalty and obedient servants, service. Yes, O mountains of Israel, I will cause men to walk upon you, even my people Israel, and they shall, put, they shall possess you, and you shall be their inheritance, and you shall no more after this bereave them of children for idol sacrifices. Oh my gosh. Okay, so he's talking to the land here and he's preparing the land for a people that are coming he's telling the land you're going to not be desolate anymore you're going to produce fruit you're going to be fertile and i'm going to cause you to be restored because your restoration is necessary because i'm sending a people to be here and live on you and declare and they're going to be blessed by you land that's why we pray for our cities because we want our lands to be blessed because if we speak the word of God over our land then guess what happens the land prepares itself for us the earth is supposed to work for the children of God he's given it to us to govern right he's I've given you the earth right so we're supposed to govern it but he's also blessed the earth and said guess what when my people are on you, you have to bless them. So that means when we, have, when we plant crops, we should expect it to be fruitful. Okay. So what if the earth's not yielding what's supposed to be yielding? Do we have authority over it? Yes. Maybe sometimes the earth's not yielding what it's supposed to because, like you said a second ago, there were idol sacrifices done on it. Maybe that land's actually cursed and there has to be some kind of redemptive quality that comes over the land. Now that's going to be between us and God. He's going to tell us what it is we have to do or not do. You know, I mean, He may tell us, don't plant there, plant over here. Don't go to that part of the city, go to this part of the city. Or you know what, repent for the people that were before you. Come on. There's strategies that we have to do if the land's not producing. If Gatesville's not, Gatesville not producing what God has intended for Gatesville to produce, then it's up to the body of Christ to ask why and then begin the process of sowing itself into the land and into obedience so that it will produce and not just because of us, but because everybody else is coming up behind us. You got school systems that are full of children who need Jesus. And it's up to us as the body of Christ to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to do so that they can reap the benefits of being in Christ. Even if they don't understand, it's a blessing. Amen. That's good stuff. It's not about just coming to church, and that's the point. This is not it. What do we... And I'm telling you, my number one thing right now, and I, I haven't even talked to my husband about it yet, is that I'm asking God, how do we sow... Where's the need? Where's the need? Where's the need? Where's the need? Not just here, but even in temple. Where, where, do we, where do we lay down our seed? Some new seed. Who can we get? Not even just even as a church, yes, but even individually. What can I do? Who needs help? 
What can I sow into that's going to cause a blessing to come to somebody else? Why is it always going to be about church? You know? Amen. Okay, let's go to Malachi chapter 4. Okay, so there's a lot more scriptures. Remember, even if you know the word of God, you know, like uh, Canaan was cursed and then Canaan became the promised land. So God's all about redeeming land. And in, in the entire Old Testament, over and over again, God talks about redeeming Israel, redeeming Jerusalem, and that the land's going to be, you know, even the Dead Sea is so full of minerals, it's, it's ridiculously rich, the Dead Sea is. I have a friend of mine growing up that he had such bad psoriasis that every single year, every summer, he would go to Israel, he'd float in the Dead Sea, and he'd be completely healed. He'd come home for a whole year, next summer he'd go back again. There's people all over that go to the Dead Sea to float, just to be healed physically of ailments. It's, I saw, I mean, before I was a believer, I remember like, oh my gosh, I mean, he'd be completely clear. It was the craziest thing ever. Then I read the Bible about all the minerals and the healing properties that are actually in the Dead Sea, and I'm like, well, duh, okay, now I know why Ben was healed every single year. Because there's properties of blessings in the land, right? So he restores the land, and then, now he talks about here in Malachi, in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, which is super familiar scripture, because here he's talking about, okay, like my people are apart from me, they're not service, they're, they're, they're just using their lips, they're not, you know, their hearts are far from me. He says, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, and he shall turn and reconcile the hearts of the estranged fathers to the ungodly children and the hearts of the rebellious children to the piety of the fathers, a reconciliation produced by repentance of the ungodly, lest I come and smite the land with the curse and a ban of utter destruction. Okay, let's go to Mark chapter 9. So we know that when... Um, the disciples were asking often... How do they know that Jesus is the one? And when John the Baptist, after he was arrested, it's amazing what a little jail time will do to you. He went from, it's the Lamb of God, to, are you really who you say you are? I mean, just like one day in jail, like, you know, boom. <laughs> it's to encourage us, guys. Is what, <laughs> I'm not slamming on John the Baptist. So, He's, anyway, so he's in jail, and now he sends his disciples. He's like, look, is it, are you really the one? And then look at verse 10. He says in chapter 9, verse 10. Uh, so they carefully and faithfully kept the matter to themselves, questioning and disputing with one another about the rising of the dead men, blah, blah, blah. And they asked him, why do the scribes say it is necessary for Elijah to come first? And he said, Elijah, it is true, does come first to restore all things and set them to rights. Okay. Let's go on. Verse 13. And I tell you, Elijah has already come, and people did not know him, did, did to him whatever they desired, as it is written of him. So Jesus was talking about, the, there's a the, the prophecy in Malachi. He's like, look, how you know this is the day of the Lord? The spirit of Elijah is going to come. And when the spirit of Elijah comes, sons are going to be turned to fathers, and fathers are going to be turned to sons. Now they're asking Jesus, how do we know? How do we know? And he says, you'll know why. Because the spirit of Elijah, and what's the spirit of Elijah going to do? Not just reconcile, he's going to restore all things. So when Jesus begins to talk about restoration, in the Old Testament, he talks, the Lord talks about restoration of a land and a people. And now Jesus comes on the scene, and he's saying, it's greater than that. It's not just a land, it's not just a people, it's the restoration of all things. And most importantly, it's the restoration of what? Communion, relationship, back with the Father. Because when we get back in right standing with the Father, then all things are given unto us, right? Because Jesus took it a whole other level. He took it beyond just blessings and beyond just having the favor of the Father to us being just like Christ. Just as righteous as he is righteous. Just as holy as he is holy. As he is, so are we. All that he has, we have, right? So when Christ talks about restoration, he's talking about restoration that includes reconciliation. Because you cannot have restoration as a spirit-filled believer without reconciliation. If you, you cannot restore land if you're not reconciled with the people on it. If you don't love the people and you don't carry that, if you don't own the ministry of reconciliation, that we, we have the mandate, we're going to go there, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that we have been given that ministry of reconciliation. It's the number one ministry every believer has. 
to reconcile people, to show people the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, to be his ambassadors on the earth and reconcile people back unto the Father. And that is included, that's the very first part of restoration, is reconciling. That's why you cannot, you cannot sacrifice for something you don't love. And if you don't have a heart for people, and can I just be brutally honest with you? I really don't. <laughs> I used to. I mean, seriously, when I first got saved, I wanted everybody to be saved. Oh, I could, just couldn't wait, just couldn't wait. I'm not, I'm not saying it now. Listen to me. Golly, honey. I loved Jesus so much. I wanted everyone to experience what I experienced. But you know what happened? I started doing the drudgery things. I got so, tra I got so inward focused that my outward focus completely disappeared. And when my outward focus disappeared, guess what happened? My joy disappeared. My hope disappeared. Because if you peer inside, there ain't nothing in there that you want to see. Amen? Because nothing in me is good. But the more I find myself captivated by Jesus, the more I love people. So if I don't love people, it's not because Christ has not given me the, the spirit of reconciliation. It's because I'm worried about me. When I first got saved, I didn't care what anybody thought of me. I didn't care what anybody was going to say about me. I didn't care if they were offended by the way I was going to minister to them or lay hands on them, and I did. And they were offended, and I was loud, and I was obnoxious about it. I didn't care. I was just fully alive. But, you know, the more you do it, People more reject you, you're like, well, maybe I shouldn't be quite like that. You know, <laughs> all of a sudden you start, you know, adjusting the way you evangelize. And when we get inward focused, and I think that as a culture in in society today, we are very inward focused. That's why I mean, like it and and ladies, let's just be honest. YouTube videos on how to do your hair and how to do your makeup. It's all about watching those things so that you can do you. So that you can be better. You're going to do your, you know, you're doing your CrossFit, you're just doing it. Everything's about your Instagram and everything. It's all inward focused. And we are so concerned about us, the way we look, the way we feel, what we're doing, that we forget about the people that are next to us hurting. And we become cynical and then we begin to die and, and then we're perpetuating the problem. And I've been just as guilty. And so, loving people has to be a part of restoration. I cannot come to any place and, it's like, if I go overseas, I cannot pray for Peru and, re and restoration if I don't have a love for the people. And the first thing I do when I travel is I, I ask the Lord, help me love the people. Because I know I can't do it in myself. And then I get this crazy, stupid love for them. And I thought, well, why don't I just do that when I'm in the States? I don't know why. <laughs> Seriously. I don't go to work and I'm like, oh, who could I love better today? I'm like, you know, dust, the cabinets. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not <laughs> more about all that. So reconciliation comes with restoration. So it's Second Corinthians chapter five. I said that. Let's going let's read it real fast. Y'all waiting for me? It's back behind my head, isn't it? Oh well, verse seventeen. It says, therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ, he's a new creation. Shut the door right there. Okay. <laughs> he's a new creation. He's a new creature altogether. The old previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh has come. You're fresh. <laughs> oh, y'all are a hard group. But all things, I'm thinking of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I'm like, I'm the Fresh Prince of Gatesville. I'm very temple, whatever, you know, okay. But all things are from God, who through Jesus Christ reconciled us to himself, received us into favor, brought us into harmony with himself, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that by word and deed, we might aim to bring others into harmony with him. And can I tell you, sometimes it's easier to write a check than to hang out with somebody and give them a word. That's how, you know, you, we make up for it. <laughs> At least that's how I will make up for it. <laughs> but it takes both. Why? Because it takes relationship. If I can't sit down and have a conversation with you, I'm never going to have a little burden for you. Amen. It was God personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them and committing us to the message of reconciliation, of the restoration of favor. Okay, well, here's something that's a little, dis I mean, okay, if we're going to carry in us now Christ, and we are now going to have the ministry of reconciliation, guess what we have to do? We have to restore favor. <laughs> 
We have to not count people's trespasses against them, their wrongdoings. Guess what we get to do? We get to forgive. How many times we have forgiven it? I don't know, seven times seven. He says in the, in the book of John, whoever you forgive, I forgive. Stop it. Stop it. Jesus, stop it. That's what he said. If you want to hold on to it, I'll hold on to it. You want to let it go, I'll let it go. That's the kind of power we have. So he's telling us, if Christ gave us that kind of, if he did that ministry for us, and now we've been brought into that same ministry with him, that means we have to act the same way. Oh, but I like revenge. I do. Then the word of the Lord came to me, and it says that you can get revenge on the devil by being obedient to God. Well, that's all I needed. Okay, let's be obedient, and that's revenge. That's lovely. I'm not saying it's easy to forgive people. It's not easy to look past their stupidity, but that's who we, someone that overlooked ours. I know, it's been a long time since we were that stupid. I know, we're far removed from it, so we don't really remember it. <laughs> but somebody actually overlooked it. Not just Jesus. I mean, like you did some stuff to people who were still in your life. Let's not be all spiritual. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God making his appeal as it were through us. Okay, hello. God is making his appeal to the earth through us. <laughs> so we as Christ's personal, represent, personal representatives. You're not just one. You know, it's the army of God. You are a soldier. You are personal represent, representative of Jesus. That means everybody you encounter, who are they seeing? And we all fall short. But I said Sunday morning in church, you know what? A committed life to Jesus, just doing every day, every day, every day, you are becoming more spiritually mature than you could ever even imagine, and you are hammering the devil. Not by your perfection, but by just every day trying again. He's not worried about whether or not you got it right today. He's worried about whether you tried. So we, as his representatives, beg for his sake to lay a hold of the divine favor now offered you and be reconciled to God. Mm. Francis Frangipane talks about how if you, if you want to really have power over and intercede for somebody, you have to lay down your life for them. If you cannot lay down your life for somebody in prayer, you don't get the benefit of that person. Amen. All right, let's go to Ezekiel 37. We're almost finished. I did good on time. Dang, I'm slamming it. Yes. <laughs> so in Ezekiel 36, he's saying, okay, look. I'm going to make these mountains produce for you. I'm going to restore the land. I'm going to bless the land. And I'm, doing the, I'm, I'm making the land turn away from barrenness and desolateness so that I can bring a people to it. And we also often look at Ezekiel 37, and we love the scripture of the dry bones in the valley, but what we also forget is that these bones were the very things that were supposed to take over the mountains. So when the Lord is telling Ezekiel to prophesy over the land, Ezekiel, I don't know if he's aware of the valley of dry bones of this place. I, ha I have no idea. But God was aware that there was an army and that there was a people that he loved that were in a dry pit, that they were very dead. And so he's like, look, I can't just, ra I could, could he raise them up and do the land at the same time? Yes, he could, but he chose not to do it that way. He was like, I want you first to prophesy to the land. And then I want you to prophesy over the people, the dead people that you don't see. Come on. Not the people who are standing in front of us erect, the dead people that we don't see, right? So I just want to read this again. We're going to pull out a couple things to encourage us. The hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley and it was full of dry bones. Full? of dry bones. It wasn't halfway full. It wasn't a quarter full. It was full of dry bones. And he caused me to pass around about among them. And behold, there were, what? Very many. 
It was full, so there were very many. They were in an open valley, and behold, they were very dry. So he's like, it's hopeless. It's hopeless. It's even more hopeless. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And answered, he answered, oh, Lord God, you know, that's what spiritual people say. And again, he said to me, prophesy to the bones and say to them, oh, you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath and spirit to enter you and you shall live and I will lay sinews upon you and I will bring uh, flesh upon you and cover you with skin. I'll put breath and spirit in you and you dry bones shall live and you shall know and understand and realize that I am the Lord, the sovereign ruler, who calls forth loyalty and obedient servant service. So I prophesied as I was commanded, as I prophesied, there was a thundering noise, and behold, a shaking and a trembling and a rattling, and the bones began to come together, bone to bone. I looked up, and behold, there were sinews upon the bones, and skin covered them, but there was no breath or spirit in them. And he said to me, prophesy to the breath and to the spirit, son of man, and say to the breath and spirit, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath and spirit, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath and the spirit came into the bones, and they lived, and they stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great host. He said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves O my people and I will bring you back home to the land of Israel and you shall know that I'm the Lord, your sovereign ruler. When I have opened up your graves and caused you to come out of your graves O my people and I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I shall place you in your own land and then you will know and understand and realize that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Woo. Here's the thing. We have to progressively prophesy. We cannot just stand in Gatesville or wherever it is we're at, even over our jobs. We can't just stand one time and prophesy the word of God. We have to stay before the valley of dry bones and we have to continue to prophesy as God tells us to prophesy. We don't get to just wham, bam, and walk away. There was, there's a price to pay to stand there. And we can get excited when the bones come together, but they ain't moving around. It's not, it ain't finished. And until the bones are moving, until life has come into the bones, and they are a person again, and they are no longer dead but alive, that is when we've completed the task that God's placed before us. And that's why even though we, we, we want to leave temple sometimes, we can't because we have not completed the assignment. The bones are not living the way they're supposed to live. And there's so much richness in this soil here and inheritance of people. This bone yard over here is full of it. Full of promises. There are people who've served in this community. Not talking about perfection, but there are people who at one time had a pure heart for God and they were speaking the word of God and they were singing the word of God and they were believing the word of God. And what they have done is not dead. It may be dry, but it's not dead. It may be dormant, but it's not dead. And God's looking for people who will say, you know what? I've given you that ministry of reconciliation. I've given you the ministry of restoration. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to hear the word of the Lord and stand before the bones? Are you going to keep prophesying until it comes to pass? Are you going to give up halfway through because it's taking too long? It's a little bit too hard. Well, guess what? It's hard sometimes. But you stand, and therefore you stand. And when it's still not happening, you stand. Did God say it or did he not say it? We've got to progressively prophesy. We start where he says start. Pray that they come together. Then we prophesy the skin. And then we prophesy the breath. And then we prophesy the life and the spirit upon them. Yeah. Now look at John chapter 5. I love prophecy. God, I love prophecy. That's why I gotta watch my mouth all the time. <laughs> Look, God could have very easily blown a wind in a valley and said, rise. He didn't. He had a man prophesy to the land. Verse 28. Oh, he says, do not be surprised and wonder at this for the time is coming when all those who are in the tomb shall hear his voice. Wait a second. Didn't, it, didn't God just say it to Ezekiel? 
There's going to be a time when they're going to hear my voice and everybody's going to start coming out of their graves, their tombs. Not just the valley they were just in. There was going to be a time when I was going to begin to speak and the dead would rise. So Jesus is now telling the disciples of John, he's like, hey, look, guess what? Don't be surprised and wonder at this, for the time is coming when all those who are in the tombs shall hear his voice and they shall come out. And those who've practiced doing good will come out to the resurrection of new life, and those who have done evil will be raised for judgment. Look at verse 30. For I am able to do nothing from myself, independently of my own accord, but only as I am taught by God and as I get his orders, just like Ezekiel. Even as I hear, I judge, I decide, as I'm bidden to decide, and as the voice comes to me, so I give the decision, and my judgment's right, because I don't seek or consult my own will. I have no desire to do what's pleasing to myself, my own aim, my own purpose. The, my only will and pleasure is to do what the Father who sent me has told me to do. What is he showing us? Jesus is saying that in the last days, with all the restoration, reconciliation, when dead people begin to arise, we're going to know it's the new day, it's the new resurrection. And Jesus is saying, look, I don't, all I do is I stand, I listen, I hear, I hear the voice, I hear the Father. And what he tells me to do, I judge it as right. Because guess what? When God says, do this, we can judge it as not right. But Jesus says, I don't do anything independently of myself. So when the voice tells me to do it, and the voice tells me that that's the right thing to do, I agree with the voice. I agree with the judgment of the Father. And then I do and I say what the Father has told me to do and say, because it's not about what I want, it's about what he wants. And he wants a whole lot of people to come into his presence. And he's telling us, just like Ezekiel stood before the dry bones, and he's like, look, this is the day that is here, just like with Ezekiel. You stand before it, you prophesy, and you hear the voice of the Father, and you don't consult with flesh and blood. You don't consult with your own opinion. You speak what God says speak, and you stay there, and you say his judgment's right. And if he judges something to where it's not going to come into new life, it's not, a, it's not up to us. There, all, there will be some judgments we don't necessarily like. Guess what? doesn't matter. God will actually save people that you think he shouldn't save. He will set free people free that you think, oh, no, he shouldn't be set free. And he won't use people that you think are full of God and on fire. Why didn't he use them? Because his judgment's right. That's a good word. That's a good word. So, this is, why, why? Why is this? Well, because... What are we supposed to speak to? The land. I really believe it's the land right now. It may change, but I feel like right now the shift, what God's asking us to do is to prophesy this land, to bring up the seeds that are in this land and get the land prepared for a harvest. And who brings the harvest in? We do. It's up to us. But I think that there's a love affair that will happen to the land. You know, when I teach a secret place class, there's a scripture in the Psalms that, you know, and basically, and that's paraphrase, is that the children of Israel are in a famine, and, you know, if you're in a famine, the seed that you have is pretty valuable. You're just not going to give it up because, you know, it's all you got, especially because, you know, there's, <laughs> there's no rain. <laughs> but these crazy people planted seed in a dry ground in the middle of a famine year after year after year. And people, the enemy, and even people within their own congregation began to mock them and say, well, you're so stupid. Why are you planting seed into ground that's barren in the middle of a famine? Hold on to it. But the people that were crazy enough to plant the seed, when the rain came, they had something in the ground to sprout. Everybody else had to catch up. They got the first harvest. And so sometimes we feel, and it, is, it looks stupid, that we are just burying seed in the ground and it seems like it's worthless. But God always sends the rain. Always. He always sends the rain. And we need to have something in the ground for when he does. So I just want to encourage you tonight. I really believe God is telling us that there is an inheritance here. And I think we should go get it. Not for us, but for him. Amen? God is good. All right.
you know, I could prophesy right now, but I'm not. Because I want you to prophesy. Don't lean on me to prophesy. You prophesy. On your way home, on the streets that you go down, you begin to say once again that these are your streets. These homes I'm passing by, they're your homes, Lord. These people in them, they're your people. We used to walk around the neighborhood in downtown Temple just praying over the houses. Just, just praying. We did that for, I don't know, a long time. Long time. We just walked and prayed. Didn't knock on one door. We just prayed. And I know that God answered those prayers. Amen? Father, raise up a house of prophets and a house of prayer. We want to join with you in your judgments. We want to bring to you the inheritance, Jesus, that you died for. So, Father, we ask that you begin to shake that seed, not just inside of us, but in the ground here, and that you'd begin to open up the eyes of our understanding, our revelation, our heart, begin to minister to, to us once again the, the deep restoration and reconciliation that you did for us as individuals so that we could begin to pour it out on the people that are around us. Let us become aware of people who are hurting, people who are, are bound, people who are just crushed in soul and in spirit, God. Give us a heart of compassion for people and not be so quick to be uh, on the move and judgmental and whatever all those things that we are angry. Father, help us to live a life like Jesus did who every step he took was so purposeful. We just want to kind of sharpen up our communion with you. And remember our purpose. It's really easy to come into the house of God and think that this is our purpose, but this is just where we get our orders. And now Holy Spirit, you sent us out with power, with might, and with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys. We'll see y'all. We won't be here next week. We're going on vacation too. Woohoo! So, love you. <laughs>